Hello, it's Scott and Lisa Cahill again. Um, we're going to be talking about a little endeavor that we're starting here. Um, we've noticed, and correct me if I'm wrong. I'm your wife, that's my job. Yeah, that's what you do all the time anyway, so you might as well ask you to. Um, we've noticed that, that a lot of people have some real misunderstandings regarding maintenance of dams what is required, what is appropriate, how it's to be done, what's important, what's not, what's bad, what's good, all those kinds of things. So Lisa suggested that we put together a series of videos where we talk about things we've seen over our know, 25 years or so of working on dams and uh, some of the problems we've seen, some of the repairs that we've made, some of the methodologies that we've employed, um, and some of the things we've learned uh, along the way, and make that available. And I'll tell you, I think that it's not just the small dam owners that need this information. I think it's beneficial also to engineers. Um, people hire an engineer to do a project on a dam, and they don't recognize that engineers have a number of different uh, things that they're good at and that they know. I hate this because Lisa looks like she's taller than me. We can't have that. She's got a taller chair than I have. <clears throat> and uh, so I think they can benefit also from the nuts and bolts knowledge that, that we have. And uh, I have great respect for many, many engineers. In fact, the guy who got me started in dam safety and dams was a brilliant engineer that used to run uh, dam safety for the Commonwealth of Virginia. And I've known so many magnificent men who were engineers. Um, uh, they, they've taught me so much and allowed me uh, the knowledge to be able to disseminate some knowledge to other people now. So that's what we're going to be doing. Want to talk about uh, what, when, how, that kind of thing? Um, a little bit. We'll also talk about um, inspecting your dam and those kinds of things. And I, I think that our goal is something is to make something that's useful for a dam owner and a property owners association, as well as a water supply, a utility, on up into uh, large power generation projects and so on. <coughs> Many of the principles are the same when you're impounding water. They are indeed. In fact, the, the issues that a small dam owner with a club or a property owners association is dealing with are exactly the same issues that a, a major uh, state or national dam owner is dealing with on a daily basis. The, the issues with dams are universal issues. And you see the same thing on small dams as you do on very, very large dams. And... Uh, I'll tell you, there's a great economy in maintenance. Maintenance costs nothing in comparison to repairs. Oroville teaches us that with their, Absolutely. I hate to even say, 100 million a month for the first few months. Absolutely. <laughs> flying rocks into fill holes by helicopter. You know, this exemplifies how a little bit of maintenance at, all, at an insignificant cost, probably with employees that were already there could have forestalled a huge expenditure. It's a lot cheaper to change your oil than it is to replace your engine. That's right. That's that's really a good analogy too because that's the way it works. If the ports that took the spillway out, the repair of that would have been a very simple grouting program. It was obvious to anyone who who understood these things when it was pending for years that indeed it was about to happen and it was simply ignored until it manifested as, as this horrible mess that that we're dealing with now. So Oroville is something that every dam owner can learn from. And there are many others. Of course, there have been dam breaks and things, and I guess we'll probably talk about that. Also, if you want us to talk about a particular thing, say you have um, somebody came out and told you you can't have trees on your dam and you don't understand why that is, or if you have rodents and burrowing and you don't know how to deal with it, or if you have um, water that's running beneath your spillway, or if you have wet spots on an earthen embankment dam, any issues you have, ask us the questions. 
And if it's something that everybody could benefit from, and, and most of those items certainly are, we'll do a we'll do a video on it and talk about it and show you pictures of repairs and where we found this on other dams. Um, another thing that we'll talk about is repair methods and repair materials. For example, two contractors may set out on, to do the same project with the same <clears throat> materials and one lasts, one sealant in the spillway lasts over 10 years. Another one pulls up in a year and a half. And the difference is um, some primer and some application method. So that one, as an example, literally every single dam owner with the concrete spillway, which is many, 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 needs to understand how this is done so that they can spend a little bit more money and get a 10-year repair versus a little bit less money and get a one to a two-year repair. That's a, that's a great Great statement. One of our frustrations running a company that just did dam repairs for decades um, and underwater work was that we would bid on, on like a sealant replacement or, or some similar thing. And they'd get a bid that was, that was less than ours, um, sometimes much less than ours. And inevitably, inevitably, um, we would be back in, in a reasonably short period of time making the same repair again on that dam. And the reason is that, that we always tried to do things right. And when there was a cost of material, what she's referencing is, is the uh, construction joints or cracks that, that exist on spillways, slabs, often. Um, we sealed those, and, and when we did, they'd last for 10 and 12 years, and other people would seal them, and they'd get to seal them every year. And they'd just come out in strings. You grab a hold of one end and pull, and the thing would come up. And it was, it was frustrating when we lost work because of that. But we, we kept our chin down, and we always did it the same way. And the people who were willing to pay the extra 10 or 15 percent or 20 percent that we cost um, didn't have to deal with it for for a very long time. And the people that saved money didn't save money at all. I don't know. I mean, maybe we'll go into how you know or how you spec those things so that because if it's left to the contractor, the methodologies and no one's watching them, then inevitably the cheapest guy gets the job and, right. and the cheapest guy is often not the guy you want working on your dam. Absolutely. Engineers, <clears throat> owners, especially municipal state owners are trapped in this low bid system that we use here. And within that system, they have to find a way to both have responsible people working on their high hazard dams and to, um, get a, get a product that's long lasting and a good solid repair. And it's difficult. We we have uh, written some papers on that, and, and definitely have some ideas yeah. to wade through the system. Yeah. yeah, nearly nearly always you need to pre-qualify a list of contractors that you know are competent and able, and have a good track record working on that exact kind of thing, uh, rather than somebody having. Um, there are critical items, and there are non-critical items. Uh, you know, the non-critical items. Bid them how you bid them. The critical items, make sure that you have someone working on it that, that understands uh, the nuances of doing it correctly so that you don't end up with a very expensive mess that you have to replace shortly thereafter. And actually, on Scott's LinkedIn, there's an article that we were, we were in uh, International Water Power and Dam Construction magazine about a job exactly like that. Uh, State Park has had two very similar dams, two different state parks. They replaced the gates in each one with the standard low bid <clears> method. <throat> and one of the uh, one of the jobs that they did, they cut the the machine gate frame in half and then covered it up with a little bit of black epoxy. So the gates never worked right, and in less than ten years, they had to be replaced after numerous. I mean, these are high hazard dams. After numerous midnight calls to numerous dive companies, one of which was us, to stop the water leaving because the lake wouldn't close, the yeah. gate wouldn't close, and the lake was draining, et cetera, et cetera. So 
that's a case where they spent a ton of money, had to take the low bid contractor. He supplied the gates that they asked for, but he didn't, he didn't man, he's a utility contractor. He didn't think about how to get them in there. And when they didn't fit up the, uh, up the sluice way, you just cut them in half. Yeah, um, we, we had bid that job and had assumed that they would not fit um, up the sluice way. And I was just amazed when this guy was able to do it. I couldn't figure out how. <laughs> he took a machine part and cut it in half. So that's, that's how you can get them to fit. Uh, we were going to have to lower them by crane down the top. And build so, a hatch. Yeah, so those kind of things need to be covered so that you protect yourself as an owner. Um, and you need to be dealing with people who, who, uh, who won't do that. It, and some of it's not malicious. I mean, some of it is a, a, a decent contractor who sends these guys out to put this thing together. He hasn't really thought every element through and they get stuck. And so they do silly things to make um, it work yeah. to make it work. And, and you end up holding the bag. So let's not let this get too long. These are going to start coming out. Um, Lisa will do some of them. Some of them we'll do together. We have over 100,000 pictures from 20 years in the industry. So we'll be putting a lot of those together yeah. as well. And I think maybe we'll kind of try to do them in the order that they might be useful to somebody, like inspecting your dam. And then we'll start addressing the problems you may find during an inspection. And then perhaps we'll do something on... Um, planning for future maintenance because whether you're a homeowners association or a water supplier you have to have a 20 30 even 50 year idea of when these major expenditures are coming up yeah. so that they can be perhaps we could ready. talk about budgeting for maintenance maintenance goes along spending very little very little very little and then there are these big lumps um what I advocate is that you put some money aside each year in a budget so that you can address the lumps when they come through the replacement right. of the gates, the slip lining project. And so you can address many needs, other things, needs that arise suddenly. Right. Right now. So that'll, that'll be a fun thing. I do hope that the engineering community will jump on, give us your thoughts, um, your critique, mm -hmm. and also ask, ask questions or ask us if you have a particular thing you'd like us to do a video on. And what you, we're going to do also is we're, we've got a lot of friends through the years um, who we've got to know greatly that are magnificent engineers and magnificent people. And we'll uh, try and Skype them in on these things so that, so that it's not just our opinion. So if you're an engineer and you're out there and you have a particular expertise, um, Drop us a note and let us know, and we'll do that very thing. Maybe you had a great, interesting project. We'll do a video on it together and Skype you in and um, put it out there so other people can be helped by it. Thanks so much.